Welcome to Word Blindness, Dyslexia Exposed. I am Juliette Hahn. I'm here with my co-host, Brent Sopel. And we are here to change the narrative. We want to educate, but we also want you guys to understand what it is like to be dyslexic and how things can change. So join us every week for Word Blindness, Dyslexia Exposed. So welcome to Word Blindness. I am Juliette Hahn, and I'm here with my host, co-host, Brent Sopel. Uh, hello. Good morning. <laughs> top of the morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love top of the morning. So today, we kind of wanted to set up a little bit about why we started this podcast. I know we've talked about it in other episodes um, as we continue with you know the, the series Word Blindness and what we're doing. But one in five people have dyslexia. It is a hereditary, which a lot of people don't know. And do you want to give us, I know, I know you have a lot more um, statistics and I know we want this dyslexia to really be out there where people know autism. There's so many things that people do with autism and that's not hereditary and, and dyslexia is, and it's still, there's so much still that's unknown and we would love to get it out there and change one person at a time as we continue, you know, talking about it and bringing things forth, you know, about schools and all that. So do you want to kind of start with a little bit, um, a little background of, you know, also why this is so important to you? Well, you know, to, to branch off what you just said, you know, autism's one and 65, I think right now, and it's not hereditary. So um, obviously dyslexia is one in five. I'm not very good at math. You know, I got to calculate and that's, that's a big, that's a big <laughs> spread right there. And, you know, I tell people all the time, we were a dyslexia as a group where autism was 20 years ago. Right. And, and what's crazy is that our the name of uh, our podcast is Word Blindness. And the reason why we picked that is because when I started researching a little bit names of dyslexia, Word Blindness is what they called dyslexia back in the 1900s when it first kind of, they realized that there was some sort of, you know, reading disorder or whatever you want to call it. And so it has been around since the 1900s, acknowledged, I guess I should say, because it's been around forever, but acknowledged. It's crazy. It's been around that long. And still, nobody's got an absolute clue about what uh, what dyslexia really is. You know, the one thing, oh, you're flipping your bees and knees. <sighs> That's about <laughs> that, you know, small of a portion of it. You know, in my mind, I think it's less than 20% of the world knows exactly what dyslexia is. That's it. And it's crazy when you when you talk about something that's been around since the 1900s. And I was really surprised when I saw that. I actually read it twice um, because I was like, wait a second. So, okay, it was acknowledged in the 1900s. And this is what then starts fascinating me because you and I met um, and we really connected on our dyslexia, it, you know, ADHD, dyscalculia. We were talking about different things, um, dysgraphia. And there's so many different versions of learning disabilities. And the schools still just put a label LD, learning disability. And it is, and, you know, we, we talk about this in other episodes about the IAP. We really dove in there about the neuro, neuropsych. We really dove in there. But the thing that's so important is there's there's still not a lot. And as you said, not a lot of people know about it. And it's funny because the little history on me is uh, my dad, my sister, as we said, it's hereditary, my son. Now I wasn't, I didn't have a label until I was in college. Uh, we knew that obviously I struggled in school. So it was kind of like, okay, you struggle in school. You know, I felt dumb. We, we, we dive yeah. into that in other episodes. Um, you know, and then when my when I was diagnosed and my dad really kind of d dove down and was like, okay, this is what I have. You were diagnosed. And if you want to tell a little bit of your story, when you kind of realized and, and realized you never even heard the word, which it's crazy. Yeah. You know, I was, I was 32. Um, you know, how I found out was when my daughter who was in grade two at that point in time, went and got her tested by a neuropsych, she was struggling and, you know, get the results and, you know, dyslexia, dysgraphia, decalca, uh, ADHD. And, um, she, you know, she's very happy because, you know, I handed that all to her being hereditary. But I, no, I never heard the word um, before that. You know, 32 years old, never heard the word. A uh, word that's been around since the 1900s. Um, you know, and that's what we talk about. We're going to talk about here, you know, every episode is dyslexia, trying to normalize the conversation. You know, I always say, you know, with my charity, with my events, if I get the word dyslexia said, you know, it's a success because... 
it, it's okay. You know, it's okay to have it, but, um, the, the under, the, not enough people understand and none of the people that, uh, have it understand what comes with that. Um, well, those defense mechanisms or reactions or past trauma from it. Um, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of different things uh, to try and normalize that conversation because it's, uh, it, you know, it's hidden too much. And I don't hear enough people talk about everything that goes with it. And you can't change something you don't understand. Right. And and I think that's what is so important because when we really started diving in, um, I know you said to me, oh, you're very positive. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, I am. Now I am a naturally positive person, but um, I actually, in a couple of conversations, I, ha- I have said to you, okay, you have brought things to light for me that I think I always spun because I am a positive person. I've always looked at things that, you know, I was born. We, we talk about yeah. that in other episodes, kind of the in, innate confidence. Um, you know, I had a support system, my family, you, you might not be good at this, but you're really good at this. Yeah. And, and, and we all have our strengths and weaknesses, right? But the thing that's important is like, you didn't hear about it. And it's funny because my, when my husband, I remember when we first met, he didn't really understand what it was. And then he's like, okay, now everyone I meet has dyslexia. He's like, it's crazy to me or ADHD. And he's like, it's like, it like kind of came in your the water. I mean, especially in the town I grew up in because it was more normalized there. And I yeah. think that is one of the things, um, again, I wasn't really labeled until I was in college, but my mom was in education and it was, okay, you learn this, you probably have this, you know? So it was kind of, it, it was talked a little bit more about it in my household. Now you, as you said, you're not. And, and when I talk to people about it now, still, it'll be funny because people will say, right, oh, you, you, you just flip your B's and D's. Yeah. And I'm like, well, no, there's so much more to it. And the reason why um, it's important to really talk about is because there's a lot of shame and guilt and frustration that come behind it. And as much as I was always positive, you know, as I started talking to you a little bit more about my story, as I, you know, I, I do, I've been sharing my story on my podcast for years now, just kind of touching on it. Um, I do go back and I, I, I kind of convert to that little kid. And I remember, you know, again, we talk about my story more in depth, but being in third grade and being separated when the rest of the class went to gifted and talented and me and the troublemaker went to special reading. Um, I still get that, that pit mm-hmm. in my stomach, even though I worked through it. Um, and then growing, you know, in high school and college and teachers constantly telling me, if you just would focus, if you just would work harder, like you do on the sports field. And I know we really connected on that because that's, you were that at, you were the athlete. They just pushed you through. They didn't care. So, um, talking about it is important because we can, we can kind of share those experience and be like, I had shame, but now I want to change the vo- vocabulary of that. Yeah, I had shame, but I want to be able to help kids that are going through it. No, you know, you're not alone. Look where I've, I've, what, what I've done in my, my life. And some of it I can say because of my dyslexia, it gave me the grit because of all the yeah, failing sure. I did. And I know you really talk about that. So if you want to kind of touch on that a little yeah. bit too. You know, there's a couple of things, you know, um, label, you know, everybody hates that word, you know, there's a label on it. Great. I don't care. Let's just find out who has it. You know, you can't, you know, you can't, if you don't know something, you don't know how to react or what to do or, you know, and understand. And that's, you know, so finding out what, you know, what is going on with that neuropsych test early um, helps a lot, you know, because the word blindness, you're not walking into, you know, that classroom blindly, you know, you have an understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's having these conversations and you know knowing that you obviously you're not alone and there's a lot that goes with this there's a lot of like you said a lot of shame a lot of embarrassment the more people that we can have this conversation um because our brains are so different like drastically different you know men and women you know different that it's hard to hard as a young young kid even as an adult, to try and explain it to somebody, you know, somebody a non-dyslexic. So, the more that we can normalize this conversation and kind of feel like you're not on an island by yourself as a, you know, as a kid, and you look in that classroom, oh, I'm, you know, I'm the only one, and I've got to, I got to leave early, or I'm that kid, I'm that kid. The more we can open it up and and make this normal, um, then the less that is going to be, 
And then that positive side that you talk about can really come into play because more people mm-hmm. know it and it should come to that. But, you know, I don't focus on that because there's not enough education on that yet. You know, your family, you know, your family has that education because there's a lot of it in there, you know, and there's, I think it's like 60% of people find out kind of what I do through, you know, through their kids, you know, mm-hmm. at, at, at an older age. So you got to start somewhere, but you have that in your family. So you were able to understand that you got, you know, pros and cons, you got weaknesses and strengths um, that got you here. But most of us don't because we're like, what is this? What do we do? Where do we go? You know, you know, how, what, when, and how. Right. And again, I think this is why, and we dive into this more in other episodes, but this is why it's so important for the neuropsych because there's not just dyslexia. There's, you know, the dysgraphia, which is the handwriting portion. There's the attention deficit, um, which people, you know, know what that is. There's the dyscalculia. So I never realized I was dyscalculia. I just thought I sucked in math because teachers were like, you're a girl, you're dumb, go sit in the back of the class. And I couldn't grasp math. Um, And I think really when my son got that diagnosed, I was like, oh, (laughs) okay. And so that wasn't something that even they really even tested back when I was there. I was just a girl that was bad in math. And, um, and that was a label, right? So I remember just always shrinking in math. I remember always looking around in class, even at a young age, you know, not just yeah. math, where the teacher was standing and giving direction and me looking around being like, why is everyone taking their paper out and writing? What did I miss? What did I miss? And really then copying off the person or like, you know, talking to the person next to me, what, what are we supposed to be doing? And them talking to me, me then getting in trouble because I was distracting class, having to sit in the front of the room because, and it was all because I wasn't processing the same as everyone yeah. else. And it wasn't seen, it was just seen as I was the silly kid that wasn't paying attention. Um, and so, as you said, talking about it and getting that neuropsych, not having the school give you the test yeah. because they're just going to put an LD on it. Again, we really dive into that in other episodes. Not having the school say, hey, here's the neuropsych doctor you can use. You have to do your own research because as we talk about um, in depth is that the school is a business and it is not your friend. And, um, you know, I learned that the really hard way with my son and it was really sad time in my life um, going through that again, feeling like I was an island, even though I had support, even though I had gone through very something similar. There's so many different layers to this. As you always say, it's, you know, the onion is, is just peeled and peeled. You know, and then neuropsych, you know, it, it tests for every single thing. You know, autism, Asper- Asperger's, you know, um, processing. So, it, you know, it, it tests for every single thing and rules out what it could be and what it can't be. So, um, you never want to go somewhere and only find out half the information. You know, you go to a doctor and uh, you got cancer, you only, you only find out half that information. Then you're, you know, find out a couple of years ago or later or whatever, you're pissed. Well, the same kind of thing that, you know, if we're going to do this, let's find out all that information and then you can create a plan for, for whoever that is, your kid, you know, your child with the information that you have at hand. Cause now it's not blind. Now, you know, and now you can uh, make the executive decision on what needs to be done for it based on what uh, that neuropsych test came back and, you're not doing it blindly, like you're running everything else at. Right. And and the thing that I love that you just said that, because it's also really important for you as a parent to have that, because you're going to go back to the school and say, okay, these are the things that need to be implemented. And if you're missing yeah. one of the things now, again, if you could be dyslexic and not have ADHD or not have dysgraphia, I don't have dysgraphia. My son, my dad, and my sister have it. I don't have it, but, um, you know, I have the dyscalculia. My older sister doesn't have the dyscalculia. So you don't know. But when I'm being There's a taught, mix and match, but, you know, <laughs> 30 to 40% of dyslexics have ADHD. Yeah. You know, so um, I don't know what the por- the other portion is with getting the other ones. I've got them all. But the big one is, you know, I always say, oh, I, I can give a dyslexia test. Okay. But what if you have ADHD? So we're not, you know, we're just going to decide to not you know, figure that out and find that out years down the road when that's going to, you know, cause havoc too, um, in what, you know, what the decision is and how to, uh, put what, what, you know, implements for whatever your kid is. No, I'd rather find out everything. 
Right. And that's the thing. So like when my oldest was diagnosed and we had all of that, I was able to go in and say, okay, no, this is what needs to be in the IEP. You know, yes, the school can kind of give you the ideas. But again, I didn't learn this until later, even though I had gone through it. <laughs> I still didn't do it completely correctly with, with Montgomery. And that was frustrating. But it was the, all of those levels, right? So again, as you said, you could be dyslexic, but then if you're dysgraphic, that's the writing part of it. That needs to be approached and, okay. and, and intervented intervention and in a different way with the ADHD part. I shared with you, you know, that was the thing in college that really actually got in my way more because of all my, um, and again, it could have been because the way my mom, you know, made sure I was taught or whatever, but that was the part that really got in my way. And I had a really hard time. I mean, I think I shared with you sitting in the classroom where it was a big auditorium. All I did was count the red shirts, hear the clock ticking, hear the people tapping yeah. the pens. And I missed everything that the professor said. I couldn't get it on a piece of paper. So knowing that how I, I was able then to going to go in and, 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 really changed the way I was interpreting what the teacher said. So having all those is is important. As you said, you don't want to miss something because then you're just screwed. And every every person is different. You know, to varying degree of it, um, all of them, none of them, one of them, two of them, you know, um, you know, for example, handling an AD, you know, someone with ADHD, you know, um, you've got to help them, you know, kind of hold them, hold their hands to get them going. But, you know, you can't yell across the room, to get them to do something because there's like a wall word stop. They don't hear you. You've got to come up. You got to get in their face. You got to talk to them. No, no snows almost. So these are the little things that most people don't understand. And if you're, you know, just for an example, you're missing that ADHD part, you know, that's a huge part of um, that kid's day-to-day -day life, you know, in that classroom, you know, a lot of ADHD kids interrupt, you know, um, but we're, if we're, if we like something, we're hyper focused. So, you know, just in finding out all the information so you can walk into that school armed with what's best for your kid. And it's not a guess. You know, you put, you know, there's a lot of time and effort. I think the neuropsych tests end up being like uh, 15 pages after it's done, you know, when they you know, go through everything. So you've got a pretty good, pretty good idea of, you know, what your kid has. Um, they're going to give you um, recommendations, accommodations that they think they should have. And you're going to know your kid too. And then this uh, uh, neuropsych will probably help connect some dots and make you understand uh, kind of some of the behaviors that, that are going on too. So it'll make you connect with your kid, you know, on a different level also. Right. And, and again, this is why it's so important at a young age to be able to have that because you're going to take the part for the kid and know, Hey, I understand, even though you may not understand, understand, but you understand, okay, this is how I'm going to help you. And instead of focusing on all the negatives, right? That's what happens in school. You focus on all the negatives. Why aren't you paying attention? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You yeah. suck at this and you miss all the strengths and you just keep putting that kid down and putting that kid down. And then that's where then the self-esteem comes in as you, you know, as, as you grow older and all those issues. Yeah. And so no, Knowing the whole picture and getting that taken care of and knowing, you know, okay, the school's recommending this, but I also know because now I'm working with a neuropsych that's going to say these are the things. And it's really interesting that you said that because one of the things with ADHD is, and, you know, there's been so many studies on it, studies on the brain, that when you go sit to take a test, you could know everything. The second that it's like, go, that pressure, an ADHD brain shuts down. And if you don't know how mm -hmm. to get that ADHD brain getting working again, a lot of times it's the, the kid has to move, right? They can't just sit there and stare at a screen because they literally go blank. I mean, I can't tell you how many times and I still remember completely going blank and being like, oh my yeah. gosh, I studied forever and I can't do it. And then you just run through it because you don't want, you just want, you don't want to be that kid that's now sitting there. Like, I just can't do it. So knowing, okay, these are the things maybe you need untimed. Maybe you don't, because I know I would do worse at untimes because it just was the more pressure. Yeah. No, it's, you know, and, and ADHD, you know, the old test anxiety or what, you know, I'm a te terrible test taker. You know, there, there's a reason why, oh. you know, and then, you know, <laughs> this might, you know, and then you talk about, uh, you know, obviously dyslexia being the reading portion, you know, your main foundation of reading is, you know, grade three or four. So if you can get a grasp at that, 80% of dyslexics never get diagnosed after, after high school. 
you know, so all that pain and trauma of being told you're dumb or stupid or, you, you know, I just want the cute blonde in the corner uh, to like me, but I just can't do the simple thing is reading and the school's not going to know, you know, so they're just going to keep saying negative things to you because they don't see it. They don't understand it. Uh, there's never going to be a positive side to that, you know, so it's the quicker that we can flip that narrative, you know, the better it is. It's going to be on, on everybody, you know, that the kid, the family, the house, um, everybody that's involved. Right. I mean, I what, remember I shared with you the story of, again, and I had all of these things. And yeah. when Montgomery was in second grade, I remember they had like the simplest homework and it wasn't simple in our house. But I also, <laughs> no, 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 no. there was no simple homework. Right. But I also yeah. had him sitting at a table with our two boxers running around, my other two kids who were two, you know, two years younger and two years, four years younger, running around and playing. And I'm cooking dinner going, honey, what, what's going on? Why can't you do it? Oh, let me help you. And literally, if I, this is before we, he had an actual diagnosis, but like, that's like the worst thing. Like, I, I mean, oh. we would literally both end up in tears because it was like, no, I can't do it. And so again, painting that whole picture, getting that whole picture. So you have the tools as parents, whether you have attention deficit or you don't have attention that that's the other important thing is sometimes one parent might have it again, as you said, sometimes one parent finds out as they're going through the process or sometimes, you know, the one parent that doesn't have it doesn't understand. And then also treats the kid different in the house. As you said, that's where it gets the harmony because it's just a whole understanding of, okay, he's not dumb. She's not dumb. She just learns different. And there needs to be tools in the house, outside the house, in school and everything. And in, in, even brought into sports. I mean, where a coach could know, and I know you're doing so much with this, with your Y program and ice hockey is because it's really important. Uh, I mean, it, there's so many levels again to it. Do you want to take us through that a little bit? Yeah. No, you're, you know, you're right. The, a lot of times uh, I have more conversation with the parents than I usually do, you know, with, you know, with the kid when it comes to this is how to handle them, you know, mm -hmm. how to discipline them. Um, I always say, you got to tell a dyslexic, they did a great, 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 great job. And they look at me like, why? I'm like, you know how long we've been struggling? We've been struggling since we grabbed that first book. So I've got a lot of parents, you know, the, the yelling and screaming or the hard love. I call it hard death to a dyslexic. Because we, you know, we shut down. We maybe maybe be there in body, but spirit we're gone. You know, so it's you know, and, you know, if you have two kids, one's got it, one doesn't. You've got to split them. You can't talk about grades, you know, in the same car or you know, in the same room. They got you got to split everything. So there's so much that goes into it, and each kid and how you have to handle them, and um, it's kid gloves because what, what normal quote on normal people take for granted is how often you read. Oh, it's every, everywhere. You know, that's what everything is all day long, right? And you guys take for granted. So being a kid, um, you know, I know what it feels like. And you just, like I said, you want that cute blonde like you or you want, I don't want a friend or you want to fit in or you want this or you want that. And it's like, okay, what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You know, and then that narrative just keeps going in your head, and that's sort of the negative side. And um, that's why you've got such a, I think, what they say, you know, 65 to 70% of dyslexics are addicted to drugs or alcohol. You know, get away from that pain. But the younger that we can find out all the information, you know, less that pain is, it's not going to be as deep or as hard. You know, life isn't easy. We all have scars. But, you know, the earlier we can find this out and turn it into a positive, the better, you know, the better is going to be for, you know, for that whole family. Right. And I think I even shared with you, I remember, so my daughter was in, I think she was four when we were finding out. Four, five, six, I can't do the math. Yet, but <laughs> there's a dyscalculia. Um, <laughs> oh, I think she was four. And it was when we were finding out all, you know, that Montgomery, his diagnosis. And I remember one day after uh, preschool, she came home and she was like really in a bad mood in the car. And I was like, you know, what's going on? What happened? Like did something happened in school. And she all of a sudden burst out. She said, I think I'm dyslexic. I think I have what Montgomery has and was like her face, the pain on her face. And I remember just being like, 
holy shit. Okay. This is not just affecting Montgomery. This is not just affecting me. This is not just affecting Dan. This is not just affecting Truman. This is affecting everyone. And I said to her, well, honey, you're four. You're not supposed to read. And she said to me, well, George, and and she said his whole name, he can read. And what I said was, which wasn't very nice. I was like, well, he's weird. He shouldn't be reading at four. Like that's, that's a weird kid. I was like, don't worry. However, she came home and I'll never forget. And it was probably like when she was churning like around four, you know, like when she was probably churning five soon. Um, And taught herself to read. I remember my mom calling me and being like, okay, Penelope just called me and said she wanted to learn how to read. And I remember when it finally clicked and I was like, holy shit. It was something that was so fascinating to me because I know how much I struggled in it. And I know, you know, my middle son didn't as well, but I don't remember being as aware because it was like they were two years apart. So it was kind of like close. But I remember also when um, Montgomery was like, Oh my God, she's like, she's reading and above my grade level. And I was like, like the pits in my, you know, like in, in my stomach where she, but she was like a determined little person. I mean, it was insane, but she saw all of the struggles that we were going through, me crying, him crying. And um, it was like a big eye opener because again, I knew I made it positive. And that's the other thing is I remember Truman one time saying to me like, well, I kind of went dyslexia. You said everyone with dyslexia is more interesting and not boring. And I was like, oh shit. I was like, well, honey, you know, you're in there because we're all dyslexic. Kid, here. Kids are way too smart for their own good. Way too smart. You know, anybody who <laughs> doesn't agree with me, you're full of shit because <laughs> they know how to manipulate you. They know exactly what to do. And um, yeah, that, you know, and that's why your household, you know, when we first started talking, you had that positive side to it because you, you know, you found out at a young age, you were able to understand it at a young age. Um, nobody talk likes about something it. they don't, and nobody likes something they don't understand. Right. You know, and she came back and you guys had talked about, you, you know, there always had been a positive spin to it because there's, you understood it. You had the understanding. Most of us don't. And that's what we're trying to do here is you know, have these conversations so that, you know, somebody let's get, oh, okay, I know, and that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I feel that way. I've got that. You know, just, you know, normalize this conversation no matter mm-hmm. where you are or, or what you are. It's everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Everybody. I don't care where mm-hmm. you are. Rocket scientists, uh, garbage man, everybody. But it's just making it okay to have the strengths and weaknesses. And right now in the society, it's not okay with dyslexia because nobody knows what it is. Right. And again, as you said, like there's so many times I have conversations where I've said to someone, oh, you know, I'm dyslexic. And they're like, oh, you know, what is it? And it always surprises me. But then again, hearing your story when you were like, no, I never heard of it. I was like, right. There's a lot of people that don't understand. And there's a lot of people in the school. And this is when it brings us back to the school, you know, it, a lot of people in the school don't understand it, obviously. They don't have it. They don't understand it. They maybe are a little bit educated in it. But again, not knowing the whole picture of a child, they're teaching to one thing. And they're teaching to... And we, I mean, I think you and I really discussed this. And this is something that makes me so frustrated is they can constantly teach to the weakness instead of taking the strength of that child and pulling that up. And that is one of the things as you you know continue, you're constantly told you're not good at this, you're not good at this, when you should be taught in a way where you can understand and learn. And that's what you're, you know, you go to school to do. And if the school doesn't understand it because they're not dyslexic or they have no knowledge of it, they can't teach that child, whether they have a special education degree or not. And again, each district is different. So if you're listening to this and you're like, wait a second, that's not my school. That's a whole new rabbit hole. (laughs) <laughs> right. I'm not I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the districts that don't know about it and don't teach it and don't educate their their teachers about it and have all those kids falling. I know I know you I know you got some still, stuff to I, say here. Know, I still haven't seen uh anybody on the superintendent side, you know, the principal side, the high level side that has dyslexia. So to to your point is, you know, no teacher is going to teach to to the strengths of a dyslexic because they have no clue. Zero clue what that kid is going through. There was mm-hmm. zero understanding. You know, so um, you always have to know that, that they have no clue what is going on. They can read down in the IP or the 504, hey, okay, it needs extra time. 
or, you know, whatever, you know, test read, whatever that is. But they just know they still have zero clue what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because they don't have it. And it's, our brains are so differently. So that's why that negative side always comes out. Well, um, you know, there's times where I get called in to educate the teachers. And you had mentioned, you know, I do it for um, sports. My Y program is, because if you don't understand it, you're not going to be able to coach that kid right away. Is that dyslexia? Is that ADHD? Uh, whatever that is, is it uh, autism or, you know, this goes on. If you don't have it, you have no idea what's going on in their head and you have no idea how to coach them the right way. And that's why for me, self-esteem is so, so important because no matter if you're playing a sport, you're playing soccer, or you're playing baseball, or you're playing football, or you're in band, or you're working, or you're a fireman. If you don't have self-esteem, you're not having fun. You're you're getting you're going nowhere. Nothing. Right. And building that in children is 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 really it, it should be everything. It should be the way it started. And the thing again with dyslexia is you can't see it. Right. Some of the other you know learning stuff. Uh, or some of the other disorders, whatever you want to call it, you can see it. So when someone, when I, when I talk to people, people will be like, wait, what? You have dyslexia? You weren't good in school. You don't, you don't look like you or you don't seem like that. And it's always yeah. like, well, what am I supposed to look like? No, but I have strengths because of my dyslexia. And that's also where I kind of done the positive, but that's also for a teacher. And we've talked about this, that just gets that, you know, that 504 or the IEP, they don't see the whole kid because this is what's so important, the whole kid. You need to see the whole kid. They don't see the whole kid. Then someone comes in and it's the kid that is dyslexic, but they don't put those two together. They don't seem like they're dyslexic. And then they start making them feel like shit because they're not sitting still or they're not doing this. And it's like, you need to educate yourself as teachers, as educators. And again, my mom's in education. I have tons of family that is in education. I highly respect teachers when you're doing what you're meant to be doing. And that's really, you know, any kind of field. Uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of things, you know, teacher always said, there's never a bad question. Bullshit. God. You're dyslexic. Right. You know, as a teacher, never call on a kid that's hiding. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why. I, I couldn't hide farther down in my desk. I wanted to turn into my desk when the teacher would turn around and want to ask, you know, ask somebody to answer that question. I've had, I, I have had kids not go back to school for weeks and months because of what that did to them. So, you, you know, never respect, you know, what the teachers, you know, their job, what they're doing. You just understand that, you know, if you have that 504, that I, if you have some understanding of that, what this you know, kid has, you know, you have a job to do. Right. And it's to make sure that kid was leaves with a smile and putting him in front of the class. Let me tell you, it doesn't do that. No. And, and that's why this is, again, so important for you to know the whole child. And again, yes, you have a lot of kids. I know public school, there's, you know, it is not yeah, easy, yeah. but you could have the kid, right? So a teacher could say to you, well, I had, you know, John Smith in class and he was just shy and I was able to pull him out because I called on him and I had this. Right. But if John Smith is dyslexic, you're doing the absolute, absolute oh. you know, opposite. And right, not all people are diagnosed. But if you have seen that that kid is struggling in a certain way, don't call him up. I mean, we talked about how you know I was called by this mean teacher that used to call on me all the time because she did not like me, and um, I said pubic instead of public. She literally in front of the class said, "Are you retarded?" <laughs> I yeah. mean, like. I'm a freshman. It's like my, you know, like you're, you're, oh. you, it's just, it's whole class it's starts laughing. Mm -hmm. Oh, forever. I'll never forget that moment. And I can actually like visualize. Um, and when I shared with you, I stood up and called her a bitch and I ran out. Um, that was, <laughs> I just had some, you know, not every kid's going to do that. My sister would have shrunk and never gone back. I had a little bit of, uh, I'm a little feisty. Let's just say that. So, well, I, uh, I, <laughs> I'm like you, you know, in grade nine, you know, freshman, grade nine, freshman year, you know, a couple of weeks in, the, you know, called, you know, read out loud, you know, and the whole class was laughing at me. And, you know, so I was, you know, pissed. You know, that turned me into being a bully. Um, biology class, maybe grade 11, standing in front of that class, okay, you're reading, right? Now you're going to count how many paragraphs 
um, to ensure there, you know, the anxiety that gets there. Um, it's just still, I have that every day, you know, when it comes to, like somebody said to me, um, we're talking about, I don't know, they're going to their in-laws or something for the weekend. We're going to play board games. Absolutely. Fucking not. You know, the anxiety of, you know, playing a, uh, a word game where you got to say a word. Oh, fuck no. Like that's, that's painful. That's not fun. Like, cause now I got to think of it, how I get, you know, about, you know, you know mm-hmm, that's what it ends up being. No, like, so nobody would ever think something like that would be, or, you know, driver's ed, you know, <sighs> break it on high. When I got to rewrite my driver's ed and that you know, test the written test. I'm whatever, 35. My son's like, you're the you're right. What's going on? <laughs> no. Well, if I can't do this, what if I, you know, like those are the things that, if you don't have, you don't understand what goes on. I can't spell this word. So you spend the next 15 minutes trying to figure mm-hmm. out how to send that sentence uh, with a different word. Yeah. And, and those are even things where even if you were diagnosed and you had like, you know, you had, but if you had that self-esteem early, sometimes you can let it roll off your back a little bit more. I mean, we, you know, again, all that stuff that you just said, I was like starting yeah, to my sweat. My self-esteem when it comes to that stuff is, is terrible because I didn't find out till I was, you know, 32. I always thought I was dumb stupid so i still i still think i am i wake up think that every day and you know i would say oh i just don't think that way well if you tell a girl she's fat you know it, you know in middle school for years guess what that's what she's going to believe same right. kind of concept so my scars are, are are deeper than than most people and that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing to have these conversations so that um the 80% of dyslexia never get diagnosed after high school, trying to change that number, you know, cancer, you want to get it stage one, not stage four. Let's catch dyslexia at stage one earlier, you know, grade one, grade two, grade three. Then you have some understanding how to grow through uh, the rest of the years. Right. And then also take away that shame, right? I mean, take away the shame, say, okay, yeah, I, you know, I might suck at this and that, but guess what? I'm, I'm good at this because again, you're now, your teachers know they have, you know, worked with you. You've gotten the help. Again, schools never that. I mean, that's the thing I think is, is there's going to be stuff that's never easy. I mean, we just talked about, yeah. <laughs> I took yoga today and yeah. um, I had to do my left and right. I mean, these are the things that people don't think about. I'm an adult woman and I have to like, literally my brain hurts to think about what my left and right. Usually I have to do an L yeah. um, to, to know. And I, people are like, well, just what hand do you write with? And I'm like, it, I, it, it doesn't yeah, matter. I, I have to it. pick up a pen. Yeah. I have to, or I have to pick up a pencil. Those are like little things that people don't think about, but someone would say to me, well, that kind of makes you dumb, but it, it doesn't. Cause I know now that there's things that I'm smart at, but knowing all the time, like, so on the sports field, right or driver's ed make a left make a right y- you pause and then when you pause someone thinks you either don't or not trying you don't care you weren't paying attention and those things build up and then when you have to do them you sometimes panic like and and even as an adult i mean i i shared with you one time i went in to read to my sons, I think it was his second grade class. And usually I would pick the book or whatever, but they had a chapter book. And I remember sitting down thinking, oh, this is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. I know, I know you're like dying right now. But I literally, and it was, it was not an easy chapter book and it was second grade. And I remember, but what was really sweet is my son who was in second grade. This is not my dyslexic son. This is my other son, Truman. He goes, oh, my mom's dyslexic, so she's going to mess words up. And it was actually, and I was like, I am sorry, kids. The teacher later was like, I am so sorry. And I was like, no, I, you know, I, as you handed it to me, I was like, oh, because I had brought my own book that I knew. And it literally, I mean, I remember I was turning red, I was sweaty, but Mm -hmm. having my son Truman say that and then kids going, oh, I know someone that's dyslexic. Oh, oh, my sister is, or, oh, that, what does that mean? Does that make things harder for you? And then, um, it just, it lightened the situation, but still I left being like, oh my God, I look such an idiot. Oh yeah. My kids, there's no, no such thing as me doing homework with them. Like, and I'll get it. We talk about our brains being so different. The earlier you can have an understanding of what that is, the easier everything will be because our, mm-hmm. our brains are so different. You know, looking at a picture, you know, my ex-girlfriend would be like, you see what in there? Where the hell do you see? Yeah. Like that's how different our brains are. So 
you know, as a kid, my kid, my friends used to look at me like, what are you talking about? Like, that was dumb. You're an idiot. Because what I said was so different than what they said. So, okay, maybe I am an idiot then. But the understanding, all right, know that my brain is different, that I see things differently. All right, you know, then you can say that uh, in, you know, in, in a situation. No, okay, no big deal. I understand. You no, know, I process it differently. But you can't say that without an understanding. No. And also maybe celebrate it because maybe what you saw in that picture is actually a really cool thing that others need to see because it changes certain things. I mean, and then that's where I know when we first met, you know, I talked about all like the different things that dyslexic people that I know and my family have done because of their dyslexia or, um, you know, I have family because there's with cousins. I mean, we, we, we really, yeah. we really rung deep in our dyslexia. Um, but like the things that they've done and it's so fascinating to me. And, and we've talked about like the creative side of your brain. I, again, in that second grade, third grade class, when I didn't go to gifted and talented, I was told I wasn't creative. Not that I wasn't a good reader, but I never thought that I was creative until I was really in my forties, which is kind of a shame because I'm really creative, but now I can kind of let that go and, and be free of it. And think, okay, that's the way my brain works. And now when I talk to like people, I'm not talking about like the things that I'm maybe not as good at. I want I want people to understand these are the things I'm not good at, but my brain can actually bring some really good things to a conversation or especially like in networking and business and all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes mm-hmm. when we, we have a bigger picture and we can start a conversation, which then leads into this whole thing. And it was just a little spark because of our different thinking and because the way we yeah. see things different. No, 100%. Um, it, it can be a very, very valuable thing. It can be, can be a great gift, you know, you know, and I, but I talk about the negative side of things to, to make sure people understand they're not alone when it goes into it. You mm-hmm. know, obviously my portion was negative in my, my upbringing was negative, you know, but I'm saying that so that hopefully it can resonate with, with somebody and, oh, I'm like that. So they have an understanding that, you know, you're not alone or, oh, that makes sense now that you're talking about that. Uh, okay, there we go. Not, you know, so I tell my story because it was obviously painful. I still struggle with it, but, you know, I'm not going to hide behind and say it was all, you know, desperate housewives, housewives white picket fence. Um, this is just my experience. And I don't hide f- from that experience because I want to make sure everybody knows uh, on all levels, what, you know, what dyslexia is and can be and how it can, you know, um, take you down or, or, or put you up. And like you said, you know, that car brain is so different. You can definitely start conversations uh, in, a, in a different light. And, you know, I think they say 40% of self-made millionaires are dyslexic, you know, because we think so differently. And that's, that's that gift. It is a gift we have that understanding. And that's all this is, is trying to get people that more of an understanding and relating to our stories and us you know, telling the truth and talk about what goes on our, with our, in our lives and our kids' lives and um, how we've had to you know, kind of grow from the bottom up and trying to get everybody else not have to go from the bottom up and you know, meet us halfway. And I love that. And normalizing the conversation. So I love that everything you just said that like that's normalizing the conversation and not being ashamed because there was many years I, I, I mean, I, when I was in the business world, I didn't walk in and say, Hey, I'm a dyslexic. (laughs) I mean, I didn't do that. I hid from it. I shared with you. There was so many times I could interview for a job because that is a gift that I have. Communication is a gift, but I would get that job and I'd be like, Oh my gosh, I have no idea. And there was a couple of times where it was very math heavy. I don't even know why I went for the job. I think it was more of like a challenge because I was a little bit psycho Um, and that kind of stuff. I was like, Oh, if, if I, you know, I want to see if I can get it, but then not sharing. Okay. Well, this is why it, it probably hurt me. So having these conversations that you and I are having, we want it to also be normalized, not only to, for kids at a younger age to be diagnosed. So then they can see the whole kid. So then when school is not as sucky as it was for us, they maybe have a little bit of a better kind of time. They're, you know, not bullying. They're yeah. not class clowns. They're, they're seen as a kid that, okay, you learn different instead of you're, you know, you're the kid that's up there that has to sit in the front because of this. You're the kid has to have the iPad. You're the kid that's this and all the negatives. We want to normalize the conversation and say, it's okay. And it's okay to talk about. It's okay to also talk about those scars and those things because it's just going to help you heal. As you said, you know, you know, healing, we, what we do is we stuff 
the alcohol, the drugs to try to get away from that. And, um, and if we can help one or two people, you know, yeah. not have to go through that because of normalizing the conversation, it's, um, it's a win. And, and maybe getting to a teacher or a principal that hears this and is like, I have an IEP meeting. I need to, I need to think about this before I go in. Then you and I are, you know, we're doing what we are set out to do. For sure. You know, I got, I know people, uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are dyslexic. They don't talk about it. No, they don't talk, they don't say a word. You know, they've been at their companies for X amount of years. Nobody had a clue. They don't talk about it. So that's their embarrassment, you know, um, from it. That's that shame that you talk about. So um, that's why this normalizing this conversation. Um, Got to start somewhere. You can't get to two till you get to one. Yep. And then having the support system, because I bet those CEOs, they've probably had someone in their life that has been able to help them where their weaknesses are, you know, the, with the spelling, with getting, I mean, you and I've talked about this. I can communicate all I want. I go to write literally anything that I've said on this. If I go sit down and try to write it, <laughs> it literally does not translate. Can't spell yeah. it. It doesn't come from my head onto a paper. And that's part of my dyslexia. And, and a lot of people have no, they're like, I don't understand. You just, what you said, can't you just put it down? And I'm like, no, like not okay. even close. Like if no. I, I've had an argument, arguments with people. All right, there's two pieces of paper. Okay, they they had, no got the words here. Now take and write the words in the other piece of paper. It's easy. I mean, no, it's not. <laughs> it's easy. No, it's not. I'm like, you're gonna fucking argue about my brain, <laughs> right? It's easy for you, but not for us. It's simple to them, but not to us. Right. And then this is like kind of brings me into where, again, if someone thinks about this, like there's things, again, strengths and weaknesses. But when someone, it, they'll, they'll ask, because then they'll be like, oh, that's so interesting. Does your brain see in picture or words or how does it, how does it visualize? And I'll say, I actually, if someone said the word tree, I don't see tree, like the word, I don't see T R E E. I see an actual, I like see in pictures, like I see mm -hmm. in pictures. So when on the sports field, you know, if, if I had to be, I had this one coach that always made me go first because she always knew I was going to mess up and then she would have to correct. And then everyone can visualize it because that's how I learned visual. I needed to, to actually yeah, physically do it. But I, and, and it's interesting because there's some people that are just visual, right? They learn just visually. They don't need to hear it at all. Some people need to hear it and see it. And then there's the, you know, the opposite, whatever. I know I've confused myself, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's, there's different ways. And someone that is not dyslexic, you know, that maybe is a traditional learner also has the learns visually learns auditory. Way. Right. Yeah. Right. And now, that's and what, what, what is yeah, that? Go ahead. You know, is understanding what that is as a person, you know, as I said, you normal people may be a, uh, audio, you know, good. I, Sam drove 10 miles. I have no freaking idea oh. where Sam is. No, <laughs> not cool. You know, okay. um, you actually just made me sweat. I hate that you just used a fucking oh. word problem. I sure. hate word. I, yeah. Oh my God. Word problems are the <sighs> dumbest thing ever. Oh my God. You read the first part and then you're like, what does fucking Sam? I don't care how many apples yeah. Sam has and yeah. how many apples yeah. Sam gave to his cousin or the fucking neighbor. Sam can and take those apples and shove them up his ass. And they all, they try and make them similar. I'm like, the same fucking, I don't can't see the difference. It's all shit. Like, leave me alone. You know, and that's, and, and that's, that's those things that without you know, understanding what you have, that's, it's torture going through those. I, you know, my kids would come home, home for homework. I'm like, go talk to your mom, not me. <laughs> not a chance. I've never read a book before. Uh -uh. No way. Yeah, no, 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 like just the thought of reading. You know, for me, you know, I love the five page emails. <laughs> not, I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, we, we, we talked about message. this. What? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but we talked about this in corporate right now, like uh, everything is done on like, it, it's even gotten worse. It's gotten everything. Any of my friends are in corporate America or my husband, they, everything is an email. And I'm like, mm, I, I would literally 
it would be torture for me because I would be so exhausted having to try to fit into that world. And it's a shame because they're missing so many different people. I mean, it is, it is really, it's crazy. I mean, he's in sales, so it's different. Maybe there's different departments that don't work exactly that way. But like, where is, hey, let's sit and have a conversation or communicate it. Why do you have to then put it in a freaking email? You know, and people don't do that anymore. And yeah, to your point, oh my God, it's so frustrating. You know, how many fights I've gotten in, you know, dating and my, when I was married over typing or miss, cause spell everything wrong, you know? Right. There's no, there's no feelings in there as words. Oh, you meant you, you're trying to type this. There's like three paragraphs missing. Oh, oh shit. Like, yeah. And I get calls like, did you mean to write this? I'm like, oh yeah, I just missed like two or three sentences, not words. And, you know, we can't function. We couldn't function. If I'm going to write an email, I spend more time on my phone trying to figure out how to spell the word. And, you know, someone might take five minutes to do an email. It might take us an hour to <sighs> do the same email. It is. And then we, we got into the whole technology talk because there is, I know you hate technology and I, um, I'm, I know you think that I'm very good in technology, but <laughs> for the average well, person, I'm, I'm okay. Me, you're, you're <laughs> but I'm okay. But we talked about in school having um, that, you know, because there's assistive technology and all these things that they bring in. And again, it's making that kid stand out, right? Who maybe doesn't want to stand out. Then it is also, okay, this software maybe is not exactly because things are not they seem, the concept seems great, but when you then have to put it into action, there's so many different falls because it's technology, right? It's technology, so it's not going to be perfect. That's even more frustrating for the child because they're like, okay, I have these things that I'm going to be able to, or adults, as we said, I mean, I know you think Siri is, is racist. She's racist, Canadian. She doesn't listen to me, but you know, it's, you know, we talk about dyslexia, you know, it's our fine motor skills. So, you know, we talk, you know, we talk about executive function. You and I are, you know, we'll get to that later. Um, but fine motor skills, like tying your laces. Some people can't. Bull in a china yeah. shop, that's part of dyslexia. So you grab your phone, you find motor skills. It's like, oh my God, what, why, why, what, you know, what? Like our hands don't work like that. Our fingers don't work like that. It doesn't, we don't operate that way. So that technology that's supposed to be your friend can be really friend. frustrating. Right. Can be even yeah. more frustrating. No, it's it's so true. And I know um, in another episode, we'll really dive into the executive functioning. But one of the things that we talked about, and I kind of want to end on this note, is there are certain things that, again, dyslexics learn different. We know that our brains are different. But there are certain strategies that you can teach. Dyscalculia. There are certain ways that you can teach math that actually someone can grasp. Um, mm -hmm. Same with reading. There's, you know, right. If you're severe, 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 there's, this is different. I'm talking about, you know, the yeah. average, the average dyslexic, dysgraphic, um, dys, you know, dyscalculia. Um, there are certain ways that you can be taught and, you know, some, some teachers are just gifted in doing that. Right. But what we talked about, and I said to you, when going through this whole thing with my son, I used to literally get so pissed and I was like, how can I change this? And again, having these conversations could help, but public school systems teach not to the dyslexic. They teach to the average student that learns average. So there could be they could change actually the whole reading program and they could be teaching Orden Gillingham or Wilson to the entire class. And a dyslexic kid is going to pick it up better than the way they're teaching now. Same with math, same with executive functioning, because again, people don't realize that executive functioning piece is, is something that every human can actually benefit off. I mean, it's the time management, it's the working memory, it's all these different things that are just going to help you in life. But public school <laughs> doesn't teach any of that. You know, and this is what everybody bases about the public school. Um, all the f you're not going to go change something you don't know. Right. Or you don't understand. You know, so... That's trying to normalize this conversation. The more normalized we can have this conversation, the more the conversation is be had with more families, more people, more kids, more school districts. Now, then we can get to a point of changing it through the whole, you know, through the whole world, the United States, Canada, wherever you want to talk about. But right now, we can't, there's, there's zero understanding of what it is. 
So as we talked, you know, today about, you know, getting your uh, neuropsych done, now you're bringing in some understanding of what it is for your kid to that school. That's what we all need to do to our schools to normalize dyslexia so that, you know, there's maybe going to be a time where we can have this conversation and, and be teaching all the kids differently so they all learn. But right now there's not enough understanding out there of what it is um, to make that change. I mean, that's why we're having this to, to be able to have this conversation and more people be open with it and be okay with it. And, you know, we can have the dyslexic crew or, you know, whatever it is, just to be okay to have the conversation. No, I love that. And I love how you just um, kind of ended on that because I want people to re re listen to that. And again, if you're a teacher, a parent, a school district, someone out there going, well, what are they talking about? We all talk about it. We yeah. know it. There's a segment, yes, that is educated, that understands, that are dyslexic, that understand, that have it, you know, as myself, even though I didn't know until later, but now, you know, with our kids, we're kind of changing that, right? We're changing that kind of conversation. Now, when our kids have kids, if they have kids, we're going to know, okay, this could happen, right? I mean, when I had my, you know, my kids, I did know, okay, I was in college, like, okay, this runs deep, someone's going to get it, right? Someone's going to get some sort of form of it. But this is for the people that have no idea. So if you're listening to this, and you do have an idea, share it, because there's, you don't know who does not. You don't know who in your world, you don't know what teacher, what administrator, what person that, you know, special education person that's writing these rules. You don't know who, what legislative person. I mean, I know you've right. been, you know, to, to Washington to change this. This is what we're doing. We're changing the narrative of dyslexia. We're okay. making it where mm -hmm. it is mainstreamed. It's normal. It is. Yeah, it's hard. There sucks parts that are sucky. There's parts that are wonderful. But having these conversations where we can talk about all of it and what our goal yeah. is, and this is what you know, you have your goal from the beginning when we first met. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, I've always said there's no class clown or, or, or oh, a bully. Yeah. I've been saying these same things. I would love to start a podcast so we can really share this because if we can normalize it and get it where everyone is getting a neuropsych, so they can find out how they learn. So then it can be done where it's done on the low level, the beginning stages of a child's development, that self-esteem part that you're talking about is going to click in. So parents that are listening Correct. that are, you know, saying, oh, I'm like, you know, Jimmy goes to school and then he comes home and he's getting tutored for 10 hours. Stop. Okay. Stop doing those things to poor Jimmy <laughs> because Jimmy is going to be a frustrated fucking adult. Stop. Yeah. Let Jimmy me find his strength. Let him run outside. Let him dig in the dirt. Let him pick worms. Let him climb trees. You have to take one step at a time. And it is scary. It is scary when you realize, okay, my kid learns different. My kid's struggling. As parents, we don't want any of that. Sometimes there's there's things that come out of the struggle, you know, where and we can get we're gonna get into all of that as we continue mm. with our conversations. But it's just important to really share this episode and share what Brent and I are doing because you clearly can hear the passion. You can clearly hear the excitement that we have. And we know there's so many people again that don't know about this and one of five people and it's inherited. So it's just going to continue. It's the second most common thing that's cancer. Cancer is, you know, one, two, not all hereditary next is this. So, um, yeah, it's to suck. Uh, autism. Everybody knows what it is. Everyone got the day, got the flag, but you know, and it's 165. Yeah. We're just going to leave you on that. So like, rate, review, and share. And um, you guys are in for a ride. You're going to, we're Thank really going to be, <laughs> and some days we might be more pissed. Some days we might be more <laughs> laughing. Really depends. Um, but thank you for joining Word Blindness and we will see you again. <laughs>